Awesome. Well, I'll go ahead and get started and share my screen. For those of you who joined earlier, Kyle gave us a bit of a sneak peek of Napari and some of its capabilities playing around with uh, the functionality in Zoom. Uh, let's see. So welcome. Today we'll be giving a workshop on Napari, which is a multi-dimensional image viewer uh, based in Python. Uh, for those of you who'd like to follow along, here is a short link to my slides, and I'll go ahead and paste that in the chat as well. Um, feel free to also share that link with folks after the workshop um, for anyone who might be interested in learning about Napari afterwards. As far as our agenda for today, we're going to start off with an introduction to presenters and to Napari in this short slide deck. And then we'll be switching over to some Napari basics, getting Napari installed on all of y'all's machines and giving you some guidance on learning how to use the viewer. Um, then we'll spend the next hour focusing on using Napari with Jupyter Notebooks um, and wrap up with a, a talk about plugin packaging and publishing. Um, so to start, I'd love to introduce the workshop team. Maybe folks could just come off of mute um, and say hello. Kyle, do you want to get us started? Sure. Uh, I'm Kyle. I've been around in this image community for a while, ImageJ, and I'm here over at Napari. Um, I, it's like an awesome set of people in this world. You know, it's not just Napari, it's, it's everyone in the bioimage analysis world. And I think Napari is an awesome tool. I'll talk a little bit about why I think it's awesome from the hackable perspective. Uh, yeah, happy to be here. Hi, my name is Kasia. I'm um, working at the Center for Biological Imaging at Pittsburgh. Uh, my background is actually in biology, cell biology, cell movement, uh, cancer biology. So I never fell in love with a single protein and uh, there were always microscopes and image analysis, what I found most interesting in my all my scientific projects. And uh, now I made it my main thing. So I um, try to make it as easy as possible for people to use these computational great tools to analyze their data. I'm very happy to be here with you today. And I'm not sure if Ashley has joined the call yet. So I can speak to him. So, so Ashley isn't here uh, right now. He's going to join in later. He's doing a whole thing on these, like, on how to like package uh, things in the Napari world. He'll talk about that, and he's you know, doing things like prepping for talks about that now. So, he'll join later. Awesome. And I'm Danielle. I'm an application scientist at Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, my background is in super resolution microscopy, more on the build um, and sort of uh, demonstration of method side of things. But I'm super excited to be in the image analysis space now um, and share with you about Napari. Um, and this workshop is really geared towards those who are curious about Napari and adventurous about Python. Um, we're assuming folks are relatively familiar with Python and want to customize their image analysis workflows. Um, and perhaps you're already creating Python tools and want to learn about um, another option for sharing uh, your tools more broadly with the community. Um, so Napari is a community built open source tool. We have well over 100 contributors at this point. Um, and P Napari is based on Python and is designed for browsing, annotating, and analyzing large multi-dimensional images. Um, a huge power of Napari is its ability to render images in 3D and uh, deal with large data. Um, the viewer itself is meant to be relatively domain agnostic and work for a variety of different data types. Um, and the plugin interface is how we're able to extend the capabilities of Napari into specific domains. Um, and uh, like Kyle mentioned at the end of this workshop, you'll learn about building and packaging plugins for Napari. Uh, this tool is in the alpha stage of development. We currently have 0.4.18 out. Um, and so there's constantly new features and new plugins um, added to the ecosystem, but we also do run into some bugs and issues and we encourage everyone to submit uh, any issues or feature requests um, on the GitHub repo. Um, Nabar, Napari is developed by an open source community, like I mentioned. Um, here's the steering council, uh, which consists of Juan, Draga, Kevin, and Kyle, our workshop organizer. 
We also have a team of core developers that make uh, the majority of contributions to the repo, and those folks are listed here. However, we have a large number of contributors um, that extends beyond the steering council and core developers, and we always encourage folks in our workshops to become a contributor. Um, there's lots of opportunities, ev even just for small contributions, um, but any contribution really helps um, the community. And if you'd like to learn how to contribute, you can uh, click this link if you're following along in the slides. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I am an application scientist at Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. So I think it's worthwhile just to share a little bit how CZI is involved in the Napari community. Um, so the first way that we contribute is that we fund some of the core developers that I mentioned in the previous slide. And we also have some employees who make direct additions to the repo, um, but they're one you know, few of many contributors to the repo. Um, and we also host the Napari Hub, which is a platform for discovering and sharing uh, Napari plugins. And this is sort of aligned with our goal of giving researchers access to re reproducible quantitative image analysis. Um, so here is what the Napari viewer looks like. We support a variety of layer types, um, which are relevant for different types of analysis workflows. Um, here you can see that uh, the layers display in the main canvas. You're able to explore three-dimensional data um, by sliding dimension sliders. Uh, we also have an integrated console, so you can interact with the canvas programmatically um, while using Napari. The layer list over there on the left shows all of the data that's loaded into Napari, but similar to Photoshop, you can toggle which layers are displayed with that eye icon. Um, you also can use uh, those buttons to create new layers if you want to annotate your data live. And each layer type has layer specific controls. So the image layer has very familiar controls. Labels layer gives some additional functionality to be able to uh, draw on your um, images. Um, and like I mentioned at the beginning, the power of Napari really comes from the ability to uh, do 3D image visualization um, and work with large data. Um, so you can see the button on the bottom left corner. If you uh, click that button, you're able to switch from 2D to 3D viewing mode um, and explore the data in the canvas very easily, even when it's rendered in 3D. Uh, you also have the opportunity to look at multiple um, layers side by side in grid mode, which can be helpful to sort of uh, suss out what's happening in your data. Um, here are a few examples of what different layer types could be used for Napari. So here we're looking at the labels layer, um, which could be used for annotation or segmentation of your images. Uh, here's an example of the points layer, which also could be useful for annotation or for rendering different um, types of data, like perhaps a super resolution reconstruction. Here's an example of the shapes layer, which can be used to select a region of interest or once again for further annotation of your data. We have a vectors layer, which allows folks to visualize um, field type data and a surface layer, which allows you to visualize higher dimensional data. And finally, a tracks layer, um, which is useful, of course, for um, time-lapse or tracking uh, experiments and visualization. Oops, didn't realize I had so many animations. Okay. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, Napari is based on Python, which means it's very easy to integrate uh, other Python packages into your workflows with Napari, uh, which for programmers allows you to build out more complex workflows. And for users, it allows them to have access to things like machine learning algorithms without needing to know how to code in Python, because um, folks can share those algorithms through our Napari plugin ecosystem. And here are just a few examples um, of Python packages um, or of tools which easily integrate with Napari. Um, I also wanted to share just how the Napari Hub looks. Um, so once again, this is the platform um, that users use to discover plugins um, and that developers can use to share out their plugins with the community. For those of you following along, you can click that link to explore the Napari Hub, um, but it allows you to search for plugins and filter based off of your needs. 
Um, and here's an example of a widget style plugin loaded into Napari. I know folks might be very familiar with that Stardust uh, uh, tool. And I compiled a list of some plugins for getting started. So for those of you following along in the slides, um, you can click that and it's a spreadsheet. This is not fully up to date, but it gives kind of a short list of plugins since we have well over 300 on the hub um, to just give you an idea of ones um, that are vetted and you can start playing with right away. I want to share a few opportunities for you to get involved in the community. The first one is by visiting napari.org. This will really help you get started um, and also has all of Napari's documentation, um, such as the API reference, which is an important one for developers. The Napari Hub, like I mentioned, is for all things plugins related. We also have a tag on ImageSC, uh, which folks can use to ask image analysis and sort of plugin development uh, type questions. The GitHub repo, once again, for those of you who'd like to become contributors or even just report bugs and make feature requests. Uh, we also have a Twitter, or I guess a thread, which you can use, or X, I guess it's called X now, uh, which is how we share out uh, news with the community and retweet interesting uh, Napari plugins and, uh, and I guess scientific work that utilizes Napari. We also have a Zulip chat. This is for more synchronous conversations. There are multiple streams. Um, and folks on the developer side of things and on the user side of things can benefit from uh, utilizing Zlib. And there are also bi-weekly community meetings um, that are themed around different areas like plugins and documentation, et cetera. So now we're gonna shift gears towards the more hands-on portion of the workshop. Oh, and I see that there's a message in the chat. Oh, thank you, also on Mastodon. <laughs> Uh, so I am going to stop share and go ahead and share this link uh, to the modules. Oh, whoops. Give me a moment here. Awesome. Okay, so here's where everyone can get started. And I'll go ahead and share screen just to show you what um, you can expect. So there are uh, kind of three short tutorials on this website. The first one covers installing Napari. Uh, we recommend that folks install the bundled app uh, for this workshop and the instructions for that are in this uh, first section. We're also gonna be using the Napari workshop browser plugin um, that Kyle made in order to kind of uh, make integration with Jupyter Notebooks um, simpler. And once you follow either the bundled app or if you prefer the Python package installation instructions, please follow the instructions at the bottom of the page for installing the workshop browser plugin. The next module is on visualizing data in Napari. So it covers utilizing all of those tools that I went over in our quick tour of the viewer, um, which includes opening images, exploring them both in 2 and 3D, doing different stack manipulations, um, utilizing multiple layer types, and then installing, I guess, your second plugin now. Um, so you can follow along um, there. And then finally, uh, we'll work towards uh, exploring some additional plugins before we shift gears towards using Napari with Jupyter Notebooks. And I estimate that this portion of the workshop will take about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, Kasia, Kyle, and I will be here to help anybody who runs into issues. Feel free to also raise your hands now or at any point as you're working through those modules um, if you run into issues. And I'm dropping a link once again to the slides for any folks who joined a little bit later. And once people have install, uh, Napari installed, if you could throw a thumbs up uh, React just so that we can get an idea of how things are going for folks. I also would love to encourage all of you to turn on video if you're comfortable. It's uh, nice to feel like we're working together face to face as much as possible, even though, of course, this is a remote meeting. Um, but yeah excited uh, to help y'all get started with those Napari basics. 
Hello. Hello, hello. Oh, so excited. So many of you are turning on video. Awesome. First person got Napari installed. I would suggest upgrading to 418, Victor. And if anyone's curious, 419 is like, it's in the work. So uh, I don't, I don't want to like over promise, uh, but we're, we're about to start testing the release candidates. Awesome. Reminder to folks to just throw a thumbs up react once you have Napari installed. So we're uh, able to gauge when we should move on to that next section. Awesome. Great. I sympathize, Alex. Kasha and I gave a workshop this past summer, and we tried to have 20 people download the bundled app on a conference Wi Fi, kind of equivalent to a single person's hotel connection. Oh, <laughs> yes. Yes, Giovanni. Uh, it's so the when you run it this way. Uh, so I'll just share the trick of the plugin is basically we use the bundled app to solve all of the Python installation problems, and then the plugin basically creates a new Jupyter notebook, hides the original bundled app, and uses that to do all the Python processing. Ah. Thank you for explaining that, Kyle. I was worried that it was shutting down, but if Jupyter Notebooks is opening up, that is what it's supposed to do. If anyone is having any trouble with installation, please raise your hand. We would love to help you out so that you'll be able to get the most out of the following modules. And we'll be moving on to the next section in about seven minutes. So. There's some time to work through any installation issues and hopefully have a chance to explore the viewer a bit. Yeah, so uh, it is making a new Conda environment, but it will not clash with other environments. It And it will actually, when it shows up, when you like try to list your Conda environments, it will not be named. Um, so it's... So you, so yeah, and that's, I mean, we can poke if you want to get into details on that, uh, but basically it's not an environment you would normally like invoke with Conda Activate. It's not set up that way. Um, there technically is a way to do that, but the, the bundled environment is trying to protect itself. So you do, so people don't actually do much with it aside from going through the UI. Mm, okay, yeah, because I was I was wondering because I just saw it took long and then I checked where it's installing and then I saw that it's like the complete environment and then it's um, because I think especially if you deal with people you are programming image analysis for, for example, then exactly this installing is a big hassle. So I think this is actually a good way. But so it means you can also not just like via the command line, then access it like you would normally do in a command environment, except, uh, I mean, you said it's possible, no? but it's not like the same way like normally. It, it's very close to the same way, but it's not it's not encouraged. So just, just if you want to know, basically it's conda activate, and then you point to the directory that contains the environment, and then everything's fine. There's a question about QT in the chat as well, Kyle. Um, so if you're installing through the like commands line, the like, uh, what, what are we calling it here? If you're doing the Conda installation, then you do need to install a Qt binding. Uh, the bundled app otherwise would take care of the Qt binding for you. Um, if you're doing the Conda installation, uh, PyQt is the one I would recommend. You can use PySide if you'd like. Um, 
but PyQt I've generally found is more reliable. PyQt5 in this case. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that, Alex. Hopefully it downloads at some point so you can jump in once it's ready. And, and worst case, these are all recorded. So you can follow along and revisit. Any final questions? Because we are just about ready to switch over to the Jupyter Notebooks. All right, going to pass it over to Kylan Kasia. Yeah, great. I I will take over from now. I will show you a uh, very easy stuff. It's like a warm up before a cool stuff that Kyle will show you. So uh, I will share my screen. So I uh, normally don't use Napari in this way, but. Uh, Everything seems to be working perfectly with the plugin that uh, Kyle provided. So let's do it from the bundled up. I'm on Mac, as you can see. And by, by the way, can you see my screen? <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Okay, so here is my Napari. And uh, I before uh, installed the plugin that you are working on. So this is the Open and Apply Workshop plugin. And uh, this is what we need here is this link that is uh, provided in the repository for this workshop. I will put it also in the chat. So um, I follow these instructions and just copy it. Here's my powering. powering. Okay, one more time. I'm feeling super adventurous today. I tested it like five times before uh, this session started today and uh, uh, worked each and every time. So just, uh, I, I please, uh, please pardon if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, Li, Li Wan. Um, uh, you can actually also try to use the plugin installation manager. So in your, in your Napari, when you click on plugins, you have a menu for install plugins. We actually updated it. So you could, you should be able to install it directly through the plugin manager. Now the workshop browser, um, so, so give give that a shot, and we'll see if that works. Yeah, and tell us if it if it works. So, um, what happened? To, I will try to make this more smooth experience for you. Uh, as uh, some of you observed, when you start the uh, workshop in this way, the original Napari window that I was using closes, and I get the access to Jupyter Notebooks uh, that opens the tab in my browser. If some of you are um, would prefer to use it in a different way to, uh, to get this repository and start playing with the notebooks that are available in a different way. That's perfectly fine. Uh, but this is the easiest way to follow. 
so I will stick to this way today. Uh, what you can see here is the collection of files uh, that may be a bit unexpected because uh, they are not your normal Jupyter files. They are in Markdown because the same workshop renders as a as the website that uh, Daniel gave you the link to. So the notebooks that I have access to when I start the workshop from the uh, Napari interface are also the ones that are listed here. So for those of you uh, that had some problems with download or, or cannot follow light, I think that this is the easiest way to, to look at the notebooks uh, that are rendered here in the, um, in the browser. So uh, there are several of those here, and uh, some of them are more advanced than the others. Some of them are having more uh, detailed explanations. I will focus on three of those today, which will be the segmentation with Stardist, segmentation with MyToNet, and then a short uh, introduction to animation with Napari. And then uh, Kai will show you this very cool stuff about uh, interactive segmentation and uh, all the hacking tools that she created. So coming back to my active uh, uh, Jupiters, I first start with the Stardis segmentation, which is this one, segmenting and measuring nuclei Stardis. And if I open this, you can see that actually Jupiter renders it uh, uh, correctly. So um, it means that uh, you see the uh, pieces of this document that are just marked down and that the ones that are executable. Let me check here. Um, I don't see the chat, so maybe if uh, um, there is some question or just please stop and uh, uh, ask questions. And uh, if there is something in the chat that uh, you would like me to comment on, if uh, you, Kyle and Danielle could just uh, bring it to my attention because I, I uh, can't see it now. Will it work? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, so let's uh, let's go through this. What we have here, and uh, first uh, uh, we will get our image. So um, this is the one that is hosted by Kevin. Of course, you can also like work with the. Normally, we work with the images that are available for for you because you have them locally. But this is a great way to get started. Also, to follow the uh, tutorials that uh, somehow it's easier to understand when it happens on the data that uh, we all share are the same. Uh, to prove to you that it is just the array that I got. Uh, this is the shape of my uh, image that is called nuclei here. This is the cell that is specific to running this notebook on a binder. So I'm running here locally on my computer, so I skip this one. And uh, here is the way to uh, open Napari window. What I will do also is uh, automatically send this nuclei image there and give it a color map. So if then, and it automatically is placed for you here. So this is our image. This is the color map that we chose for it. I find that, uh, uh, of course, uh, one super powerful thing about Napari is the access to all the plugins. And the second uh, most powerful thing is uh, this uh, very quick interaction between the viewer and your notebook. And it is super important for fast iteration and changes and uh, having a very detailed access to the data so it will allow you for troubleshooting. I can actually, this is a neat thing, if you treat your notebooks as the documentation of your analysis, this is a great way to remember within the Jupyter document uh, what was happening in your browser to get a screenshot and uh, to display it in a viewer, uh, to, to get a screenshot of the viewer and, dis and display it in your, um, in your notebook. Which um, doesn't print here, to my surprise, so I'm sorry for that, but uh, um, In the 
any any Jupyter notebook that would normally work. I think that I have some problems with this, uh, uh, keeping it fancy in the markdown for the Jupyter book. Okay, um, moving on. Let's go to the segmentation we've started. What uh, this section describes here in this notebook is how to use the graphical interface of the plugin. So to get the start this segmentation plugin, I come back to my um, uh, viewer. I go to plugin menu. And uh, for those of you who um, just installed Napari, you will have to go here to install uninstall plugins. This is the same way as you install actually the workshop plugin itself. Uh, you can find the um, Stardust plugin here. This is the one that uh, here on my computer is already installed. So I see it in the upper menu. If you just start, you will see it here. You click install and uh, within a few minutes, you will have it available. Once it is uh, installed, um, you will have it uh, uh, available in this lower part of the menu. So I can click on this one. Um, Actually, when it happens uh, for the first time, it uh, may be uh, some waiting time of one or two minutes because a Stardist will uh, additionally download its own model. So it means that it has to communicate with the server. If uh, any of you have, uh, don't, so don't worry if you have to wait a minute or two and this wheel is spinning, everything is fine. Uh, but if you encounter any problems, so the, uh, the this window doesn't appear on the right side, please uh, uh, unmute yourself or put it in a chat and we will troubleshoot with you. What you can see here is actually, if you look at this uh, document on the website, you will see all these screenshots of what I will be clicking in, in the user interface. They do not render that nicely here, but you can still see the text uh, of the instructions. So what I want to achieve is the segmentation of this image. I choose the input, which is my available layer here. Very simple because I have only one. It will be a 2D segmentation of the versatile model. So I follow this instruction available here. I will ask for the normalization of the image and uh, more or less, uh, uh, you know, Stardust is uh, so good that I will use default setting and let's see what's happening. Once I'm happy with what is uh, chosen here, I click run. Depending on your computer and depending on uh, the access, uh, uh, so where the computation will be a bit longer. Um, I'm actually on my laptop here, that's a uh, uh, Mac, uh, MacBook, and uh, that is, uh, as you could see, pretty instantaneous for this uh, single two-dimensional image. Inter what is What do we have here? So for those of you who know the Stardust uh, uh, segmentation algorithm, you are not surprised. It did an amazing job on this nuclei. That's exactly the kind of images that it eats for breakfast. And uh, what it produced is the output of two additional layers. So as Daniel explained at the beginning, the, the, the data within the Napari hold here, uh, Stardust added two layers the label layer and the polygon layer. So I can toggle it uh, in and out to show you the difference. It's actually super important in the context specifically of Stardust because as you can see, Stardust uh, assumes that uh, all the objects that it, founds are, that it finds are oval based shapes, which means that uh, it is not possible to encode this information simply in the uh, labels layer. How can I say it? When you make the labels layer, uh, the active one. I will move this here. And if you hover over the uh, image, over the active layer with your cursor, you can see the value here in the uh, bottom uh, left corner. So for this cell, this is 720, and for this is 745. If I remove the uh, polygons, uh, you see that actually this middle cell, which probably is, if you look at the original image, 
let me make it a bit brighter for you. It's probably indeed the case that there are three cells here, but uh, the labels layer cannot uh, encode this information. This, this cell becomes, this nucleus becomes totally misshapen. You have this full uh, oval here available in the, in the polygons. Which one is the proper answer? Do you really want to include this uh, overlap region in your analysis? Of course, depends on your experiment and uh, on the kind of analysis of the data that you are interested in, but uh, it is something important to take into account. So, so far, so good. Um, did you... Uh, Maybe I will pause here. Did any of you successfully get the segmentation? I will stop sharing for a moment to see you. Thumbs up, thumbs up for good segmentation, thumbs down if something didn't install, didn't segment, didn't behave as expected. Oh, I have a thumbs up from Ryan, thank you. Also, for those of you who are not doing, uh, who are not following actively, are just looking at the notebooks. If uh, you have any like questions, something doesn't make sense, uh, please. Uh, there, there are no stupid questions here. I may just get, give you not the smartest answers, but all the questions are great. Thank you. We have successful segmentation. What's happening on yours, Jan? It... Oh, I don't know. I tried. Uh, I tried to install the Stardust Napari um, internally with the with the plugin installer, and it it finds it. It says it's installing, and um, but instead of popping up in the installed plugins, it's popping up again in the non-installed plugins and it doesn't do anything anymore. Uh, so, and, mm -hmm. Do yeah. you install, when you were installing Napari, um, did you install it as a bundled app or as yeah. a, uh, from the environment? The bundled app. Did you choose the location to which you have access? What happened to me is like Windows automatically tries to put it on the C drive. And even if I have an admin account, Napari doesn't want to save there anything. So the installation became difficult. Mm, yeah, okay. It is on a C drive, but I succeeded to install, for example, a Napari assistant. That works, but the start is That's done. A good point. So I don't know. Yeah, we don't need to solve this now. It's just one thing you might try is just doing the pip install in the Napari console. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think actually it's like uh, running into these things uh, is super valuable within this workshop because uh, probably if it happened to us here, it will happen to many people. So let's just uh, uh, put out there the possible solutions. Uh, so if something doesn't work for you, it doesn't mean that it's like you did something wrong. It means that this is this situation that has to be, you know, put in this tutorial and accounted for. So we super appreciate your feedback. Um, I don't see any thumbs down or... There is another problem with the installation. So... Um, yeah, we will come back to this. If you could try this uh, install directly through PIP, we will check if it if it worked, and I will move on with my uh, with my sharing here. Okay, so coming back to this, uh, this is the this was the output two layers, labels, and polygons. Okay, coming back to the notebook. Because what is so powerful is that actually I have now full access to the output of uh, Stardust. And you can see it here. One I here is uh, I expected that some of you may write, run into troubles, but would like to follow. So I included the output, the, the layer that was produced by um, 
studies. So if you execute it, you will get access to the variable called label in, which is exactly the same as the one that uh, was just uh, uh, the output of studies. And to prove it to you here, actually send it with exactly the same name. So the layer like started to, oh, I cannot be the same. So it's now one. And if I toggle in, in and out, you see that it's exactly the same. Okay. So coming here, um, this is the line of code that is the best thing about Napari. The fact that you can so easily get all the data from any kind of label back. So if I execute this piece of code itself, let's emphasize it. Let's give it a separate cell and let's see what I get. Oh, I, I can't do it yet. I can't do it yet. Um, what I get here is the access to the layer. What I really want to get here is the access to the data of this layer. Let's try again. Yes, finally, I have my array, I have my data. So this is my segmentation output, which means that this is something that I can use in my downstream analysis. And what we will do here is a single uh, measurement on this segmented layer. So um, what I did here, you see, is also happening in my when I send this data for the quantification. I use probably the most popular function in image analysis ever, which is the region probes from Scikit Image, which uh, allows you to access uh, a lot of parameters of uh, uh, labeled image. So here, for example, area and perimeter. Let's see what is my output. Here we are. My output is in a form in, of the dictionary, which contains these uh, two things that I asked for, the area and the perimeter of all the objects. So here, just, just because we can, let's see how it looks like. Uh, we will do two things with this data. We will calculate the median value of the area of, the, of all the objects that were detected. And here, using matplotlib library, we will create a histogram to display this distribution. Not close area, what is my median 95, very well behaving, uh, sort of uh, normally looking distribution. Um, the rest uh, of this notebook here is just uh, telling you that you can use this data to now uh, extract more complex uh, characteristics of the object. So for example, here we calculate the circularity. So how uh, close the detected ovals are actually to the circles and use another plotting function from the matplotlib library to see a scatter plot between if there is any relationship between the areas so and the size of our objects and how, how circular they are. Um, it's actually for these uh, nuclei, nuclei that were very well behaving, there is uh, uh, not a lot of uh, um, relationship. Yes? Sorry, I thought that there was, a, there was a question. The interesting thing about this analysis is that the circularity should never be above one, but uh, I will, uh, and the equation is correct, so I will leave it for you as a puzzle to solve uh, on a computational level, and uh, this is beyond our uh, Napari adventure here. Let me show you two more things. Um, pause. Are there any questions? Coming back to my list of the notebooks, this one will be super similar to the previous one. This one is uh, like in principle because we will also use an Apari plugin to segment something. This time we will use the Mitonet network. So Mitonet is available in Napari through the plugin that is called Empanada. 
If you open this notebook that is called MyToNet segmentation, you have links to the uh, original data set and the uh, explanation of the plugin and this great network uh, that stands behind the Empaniada and allows us to see mitochondria in the electron microscopy images. Here it's uh, another way, actually emphasizes another way of how the plugin can be installed. This is something that uh, Kyle just suggested as a troubleshooting for Salpo, for Stardis. Um, Salpo is another uh, segmenting network, so they all go together in my mind. Uh, Stardis, Mitonet, and uh, Salpos. So without using the interface, you can use the PIP to install the plugin. I uh, did it before, so here it should just report that all requirements are satisfied. I need these additional libraries to get the data. And uh, this is another, in the previous notebook, we just got an NumPy array, which was available under the URL. Here we will get access to the Janelia electron microscopy data. So it was actually, for the sake of this notebook, an absolute exaggeration is a gigantic data set of the uh, morphology of, with amazing resolution of the morphology of my cells. Uh, we will use it to only get a tiny piece for an example of segmentation. But uh, I will put this, uh, uh, I decided to put it out there so that you know how to access this data and play with them and uh, maybe it will be, uh, hopefully it will be uh, useful for you. Of course, I cannot execute this cell because I didn't import ZAR library. That looks like something that should be executed. Let's get a new NAPARI viewer. So when the new window is created, so just to make it clear, this one is totally independent of the previous one. At the moment, my on my computer, each notebook uh, governs its own NAPARI window. And uh, now I can get access to the data. What I get this data in is the list of arrays of different uh, resolutions, so of different shape. If I ask uh, Python to give me the shape of these arrays that are in this data structure that I called here the data, you will see that these are the arrays starting from the highest resolution to the lower and lower. I will not, this is beyond the um, purpose of this uh, uh, workshop today, but uh, the combination of ZAR and DASK is uh, super powerful to get access to this uh, gigantic data set so that you can visualize them on different resolution levels and also to get pieces of the data to, to, to play with your own analysis. So um, I will actually use a very small piece of it and send it to Napari. Now it takes a moment because uh, you see all these gigantic arrays were like reported that they exist, but they were not downloaded to my computer yet. And only now when I ask for this uh, tiny piece and I want to send it to Napari, they are actually downloaded. So that's why here was the, the waiting time was almost zero and here it was a few seconds. But when successful, you should have access to this uh, piece of the um, cell that contains a beautiful uh, mitochondria with very nicely visible crystal. This is just a 2D, there is, a, a, there is just a two-dimensional image. Okay, the segmentation. Um, here is, uh, as we also installed the uh, plugin just using the Jupyter Notebook. I also use the Jupyter Notebook to open the, the widget. So here is uh, now in this viewer and Panyada appeared on the right side. You can also start it here from plugins. Uh, because it's uh, available as Empanada Napari, and the interface that you see on the right is this 2D inference parameter testing. Um, there is a whole set that I 
what's the default settings that I chose for you that I know that will work well for the segmentation of this image? So I have my tonnet, I will die on the sample, it by two, and I will ask for the fine boundaries run to the inference. Hey, Alex, so the MitreNet Jupyter Notebook should have, it should be in your listing from Jupyter if you're running the Jupyter uh, workshop browser, uh, sorry, the Napari workshop browser. Um, so uh, I, yeah. this is this file, MitreNet segmentation. They have shorter names than the ones that you see uh, here in the in the list. But this is the same, uh, the same notebook. Okay. Okay. So this is my output. It's like, I would say it's, uh, you know, amazing for the segmentation of electron microscopy image. It definitely figured out which, o which of those objects are mitochondria is relatively good with uh, separating them. Okay. So coming back to my active notebook, which is here, let's do some quantification. Uh, the flow is very similar. I will use slightly different library for plotting just to give you options. All these snippets of code out there are available. I get now my mito labels from the uh, Empanada segmentation 2D layer. Let's back, come back to the browser. This is exactly how this layer is named. And that's why I have access to this. I send it to the region props function. And here, what I get, I get the label, which is, which corresponds to the number of uh, which each mitochondrium gets. If you make this label active, you can see what is happening here in the bottom corner again. again. And uh, using that, I will actually use a slightly different way of plotting it. I will use the pandas library, which is super useful. And uh, works beautifully with this plotting library to give us a histogram of the areas again. And what I can see is that actually the distribution of the sizes of this object is um, well far from normal. So majority of those are the small ones here. Actually, maybe to see it better, I will give it things number 50. You see majority of objects is actually super small, which is uh, mm, surprising because uh, it's also the number of objects. Let's see the number of objects. So my data are now in this data frame. Oh, this is, I'm not very good in estimating, but I would say that 38 is much more than what I would expect from this image. So it is the situation that uh, happens very often in your like analysis pipelines, especially at the beginning when you figure out how everything works, that uh, you have to do a bit of troubleshooting to understand what is happening. And the first thing that I would uh, question here is that uh, some of those objects are probably not complete mitochondria because they are touching the borders and uh, there is a very easy way to check it. There is a function to remove all the labels that are interacting with the edge of the image. So I use this to select the labels that will be full and uh, I send it back to my viewer to create a new layer. What I also did, I use this function to disable the original segmented labels. So now you can see if I toggle this one in my selected labels, I only have mitochondria that are fully present in the image. Um, so far, so good. Let's, uh, let's see what we get from quantification. Let's. Well, I still have a lot of very small objects and it's uh, honestly not something that I would expect from the histogram of the analysis of these objects. 
And here is like um, what is one of the powers of Napari is that you can investigate this data very in a very easy way. So let's see who is guilty here. If I look at, so this is my data frame. It contains all these measurements of the areas. Let's um, sort it. So now it starts with the smallest one. And I have objects here that have only one or two pixels. It's like, that's definitely not what I would like to see. And this is this label. So I copy it. I come back to my viewer. I have selected labels active. And I would like to see this particular label. I want to see where my problem really is in this image. And I will ask for show selected. I'm not sure if you will see it on your screens, but uh, because it's just this single pixel, I know because it's, so I see it on the screen because it's uh, it's blue, so the contrast is visible. So it's like there is an object detected here, which is, um, let's see. And there is a lot of edge artifacts that happened here, but I learned something. I learned that uh, this is, uh, these are the objects that are definitely not true mitochondria not very surprising, but uh, also that they probably don't really matter much in the quantification of other objects. So the easiest solution to get rid of the, from my final quantification of these edge artifacts would be just to get rid of them. So if I now decide, to plot everybody else besides these very small objects. Let's put some threshold on it. Judging by this distribution, I think 100 is a very safe value. I put in threshold, the first one. Yeah, yeah, what was the time? Thank you. Probably this one is now an overkill. Well, this looks much better. So I got rid of the um, everything that is not an object. And uh, because I had this very easy way to, uh, you know, like check what's happening, I'm pretty convenient. I'm pretty convinced that. Uh, eliminating these small objects will not change what I will, uh, conclusions that I will make about this distribution. So back and forth between the Jupiter and Napari is super powerful. I think I'm um, running out of time. So very quickly, let me stop sharing and uh, check with you. Uh, how did it, How did it work for you? Did you manage to get the quantifications? Did you manage to get the data back and from, uh, to and from the viewer? Thumbs up, thumbs up, thumbs down. How did it work? Okay, I have. Thank you, Miriam. So there was there. There is uh, there is there are some successes. Great. Okay, very short demonstration of the last powerful thing about Napari. I'm coming back to my list of uh, files and I will try choose this one. Try animation. Again, the first cell is for executing in the binder, so we will let it be. This one is for installing the Napari animation plugin. I think I already have it, so all the requirements are satisfied. 
I, I import the libraries, which will give me access to the data. I will be actually using the same data set of electron microscopy uh, cells. The good thing about this data set is that it not only contains images, but also labels. So you can uh, play with the beautifully annotated uh, mitochondria. I downloaded this data. I chose my resolution level. I chose the fragments that I would like to look at. And now I will send it to my Napari window. This time it's a three-dimensional object. So as you can see, I can go back and forth. I can also, as Danielle showed you before, view it in 3D. For electron microscopy, the default uh, rendering in 3D, which is great for electron microscopy, is not the best. These are not translucent data. Um, these are not transparent data. So I can show you that it's actually this cube of tissue that is visible here. Okay. And if I would like to create an animation from Napari Viewer, I go to my animation plugin, which is called Wizard Napari Animation. And uh, creation of the animation, it has this idea of the keyframes. So you choose uh, how, what will be your points, like the anchor points, and how much time should pass for the rendering between one and the second point. And uh, I included some links in the notebook if you're interested about this process and would like to understand it uh, more. Uh, for those of you who played with this functionality in other image analysis software. This is always the same principle. We capture the uh, keyframe and we capture another keyframe. And now every frame in between here, actually 15, because this is the default number of steps will be rendered. So if I use this uh, um, slider, I can now rotate it. You can use this wizard to save the animation, but uh, the whole thing can also, and you have the exact explanation of the example that what you can do here. Um, but uh, the whole procedure can be done just by uh, writing a, a, this short piece of code so that when you know what you exactly what you want to do, or you want to, you know, tweak something in a very complex series, it's actually easier to work with this piece of code than the keyframes that are available here in the wizard. So this part of the notebook will guide you of how to get from here, so to, from manually using the user interface to use the code to save this animation. And uh, here I need to choose my path. For the bundled app, here I uh, gave up, gave you this hint. If you do not specify the full pathway, it will save where the notebook executes, which probably is in some obscure cache, but you can still find it on the drive using, uh, using this command. But I will send it actually to my desktop. All right, so this is my save path. And this is... Uh, using the animation wizard directly from the Jupyter notebook. That is remembered. And now the frames are automatically rendered. Um, let me show you. What was my, how did I call it? My animation from script MP4. My animation from script MP4, this is my file. file. And unfortunately it didn't work. Coming back, I suspect it didn't work because I do not specify that I want to navigate through this. I will close this wizard in 2D. So I changed the viewer into the 2D mode. Now I can slide. I come back. 
I execute it once again. I think it couldn't uh, override this file because it was still open by the viewer of the system. So this is a very simple animation of uh, going through the uh, layers of this 2D uh, set. So far, so good. But what you can do is actually much, much more complex. And this is the script that I took from the uh, forum.sc, which is always the source of great ideas. And uh, this will give you an idea of uh, how much more complex animations we can get. So I will open the new viewer, center both the image and the layer, but display it in a different way. So here I specify that I want the depiction of a plane. So now the actual data set is only visible as this single image here in gray. And what you can see as these colorful objects are three-dimensional segmentation of mitochondria that I also downloaded from Janilia. So that's how it looks. I also specify here the camera angles, but now I played with it. So to just demonstrate to you once again, how easy it is to get these values back and forth, I can get my new values of the camera because uh, that's exactly the position in which this object is. But coming back to the good ones, because I know that it will make a decent movie, I said it, it, so now it is getting back to the original view. And I use the Napari events to create the uh, animation in which my labels will be dynamically changing depending on the position in the movie. If I execute this, oh, probably I need to change my pathway again. Looking great, the cell executed. Animation labels. You can see that how much of the labels we see now in this three dimensional uh, visualization depends on the position on my single plane. So, um, This is to illustrate to you that uh, you can use these tools to build the solutions that are uniquely suitable for your own data in a very easy way. I, this code is uh, available in the notebook. Uh, you can see the original version here and all the conversation of how it happened. So I, I'm not the author of this one. Uh, and uh, as always, uh, forum.sc is exactly the place where to look for these treasures. So I stop sharing. Are there any questions about uh, uh, animations?
off. Thank you, Edward. It worked for Edward nicely. Okay, no questions. So I uh, give the stage to Kyle. Thank you. Okie doke. Cool. Thank you, Kasha. That's actually a perfect segue. Let's switch cameras because my normal camera, my normal monitors are tall, so they're really bad for screen sharing. All right. This should be really desktop. You see a Jupyter window, I hope. Um, and just to be extra careful, where's the optimize video? Okay, optimize for video sharing. Okay, all right. So as Kasha showed, the i mean so she was showing basically how to like hack one of these animations together i mean like with that final demo and like that extensibility is one of the most powerful things that we have in napari i think um all right so uh one second i want to i want to show of hands first so how many folks have used elastic like the interactive segmentation tool Cool. All right. Some enough. I I know some. Uh, I know some of you here, and I know you've used it, um, or at least have tried. Um, okay. So lots of people. All right. So then let's hop back over. So here, I am going to show you how to make your very own impoverished version of Elastic in Napari pretty quickly. Okay. So what do we have? So what data are we going to use? We're going to start with Locrayer's Groups Zebra Hub. Awesome data set. I mean, this is their single cell stuff. You can check over here uh, to find basically where to find the data. Um, we're going to be basically going through their HTTP access. Let me show you so you get an idea of what, what we have. Very easy. I like the I like the approach they used for making it very accessible. So Kasha showed you how to use a an N5, uh, which is one of these chunked file formats provided by Genelia. Uh, N5 was developed at Genelia. The community has kind of converged on a file format called ZAR. Um, these chunked file formats are about uh, why do we have them? Because we have these massive data uh, and you don't want to put everything in a single array. Sometimes you can't. So we put it together in chunks. What does a, one of these look like? So here we're just, it's the idea is you split the data into chunks on the file system. So all of these are basically referring to coordinates in the data set. And one of these is a single chunk. I can't show you what's in it. It won't render properly because it's compressed. Um, but this is kind of like, it's the zeroth time point in the zeroth channel at the zero X, zero Y, zero Z uh, coordinate. And it's a, a kind of a crop over there. That's what the data looks like. That's how we're going to fetch it. Okay. Here's what it looks like in Napari. Um, we'll, we'll pull it up as we go. Uh, and this is what we're hoping to do. This is like not a great segmentation, but I literally took like three paint strokes to do this. Um, okay. So as per usual, we're going to skip our binder cell. Um, there's this pip cell. Uh, all this is installed in mine. I don't want to get a bunch of output, so I'm not going to run that one. I have a lot more imports. Um, I'm happy to talk about it, especially offline, if folks want to reach out about it um, to explain some of these. But I, I'm hoping to make it through, because I think it's cool if you can make your own interactive segmentation tool. Because sometimes Elastic doesn't provide the features you need that you think will actually be most informative about your data. OK. So similar to Kasha's, we're going to open our data from Zebra Hub. Uh, it's a czar, so this is remote. Um, so we're using the OME czar Pi plugin. You can install it as OME czar. Um, you can see it above. So we've opened the data. What's the shape? Uh, let me show a little more. Um, so similarly, it's a bunch of arrays, um, a lot of time points, single channel, ZYX. Uh, okay. So we don't want to work on the biggest one because 
time and bandwidth. Okay, so we'll do a crop. We're going to grab from this third one, this third level with zero indexing to, to do. Uh, okay, and we're going to grab a sing single time point. Okay, this is what our data shape is. Let's get us a Napari so we can see it. Okay, wrong monitor. Here we are. Okay. Oh, oh, we're in 2D. I'll show you in 3D. Very satisfying. I always love looking at zebrafish embryos. Um, they're just so cool. You can see like so might formation. Oh, fantastic. Um, one thing that's a little bit interesting here is I did add a bounding box. This isn't exposed in the UI. So if you do want to, sometimes you have a lot of like blank area in your image and it's useful to see where the bounding box is. So you might want to just pop that on sometimes. Okay. So we're doing machine learning. Uh, so what do we need to do? This is going to be a little more traditional, old school, whatever. Elastic, classic elastic is a little old school as well. So we're going to extract features from our image, things like edges, texture, uh, and even some like intensity averaging with Gaussians. And we're going to create feature maps. And then we're going to train a fairly straightforward machine learning model, in this case, a random forest to classify. So we have just for kind of convenience later on, some way to kind of collect our selection of parameters that specify our features together. This will take a hot minute to run. Uh, so this function, we're using the multi-scale basic features. This comes from scikit-image. We didn't do much on top of it. It is possible to add our own features on top of this, um, on top of just the basic features. Okay. So we have our original image shape plus 15 feature channels. Um, so we've computed those. And I just did a screenshot before. I'll run this again so you can see. So let's check out what our features look like. Hop back to Napari. So the, they're scaled. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. It's not that critical. It still is the same data size. Um, and we didn't do gallery mode. Um, Maybe in the future, gallery mode isn't going to be as important because some people here actually are working on some fantastic improvements for multi-canvas. So you can have like multiple views in the multiple kind of canvases in the same Napari window. That's going to be fantastic. Okay, so we have our features there in 3D. You can see they're a little more squished than the other one. And that's what I was kind of hinting at. Um, so when we computed the features, we didn't do anything special to account for the, the voxel size spacing. Um, but that's, you know, we're, we're not worried about that quite at this stage. We're just kind of trying to blow through this. Okay. So each of these, they're unique. You can see there's different things about each one. Um, you can dig in on your own to see what's different about each feature here. We're not going to actually use these in the viewer. This was just so you can see what's going on. I'll turn off that mode. Okay, we're back to our zebrafish. Fantastic. Okay, that's what the features look like. I just left that commented out because it's not that useful later on. Um, yeah, don't worry. I there You might see some warnings in here because of the way this is put together, but things are running functionally. Okay, so... There was a request uh, from folks to actually show how to do this interactive segmentation with ZAR is actually where we're going to store everything we paint and predict. Um, one of the reasons we like that, again, is ZARs can support massive amounts of data uh, because of this chunked file format. So we could have done, we could have actually used a num NumPy arrays here. It would have, this part of the, this code cell would have looked more simple, um, but just so you can have some better tools for the future. Okay, so our Napari's here. Uh, we have some of my old predictions. Sorry, one second. I'm going to just freshen things really quickly. Um, just so you know what I'm doing off screen, I am just deleting that whole czar that used to exist. And hop back over here, get rid of those layers. I'm going to run this again. Hopefully I don't see anything painted. I, okay, I didn't do the uh, wrong, I guess, order of operations here. Delete these. Deletes are, and if it doesn't work, I'm just going to roll with it. 
uh, back here. Okay, I'm just going to roll with it. Pretend I didn't paint. I can, uh, you know what? Uh, I can erase really quickly. I okay. Anyway, we'll 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 get to some of the uh, some more stuff in a second. Okay. Um, the scaling issue I was talking about, um, one thing you'll notice, I actually grabbed the scale from the czars manually. Um, you, we can extract that uh, other ways, but you can just really quickly if you want to. So show you where I am. Okay, so going back to the czar, going into the individual czar, there's this Z adders file, and this is describing the metadata of the image. Look in here. So we're seeing this is the highest resolution. Scale is one 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 uh, on on time and channel, and it's pretty high resolution uh, for the other pixels. We're on this path three. So I grabbed these scales and just did it manually. Put it in there, and I figured out the contrast limits manually as well. Okay, past the features. All right, we have our painting and prediction inside. Okay, so. One of the things that's very nice about Elastic is it has a nice UI. Um, so we're not going to get all the way to making a nice UI like Elastic. That's that's not what we're trying to do here. Um, but we're going to make a Q widget. There are other ways of making UIs in Napari. If there's time, I'll show you really quickly. I have, I have one for Magic GUI. Magic GUI is a very powerful tool. Uh, sometimes it's a little more straightforward to just make your own widget from Qt by scratch. So I won't step quite through these, but we add like a drop down to select different models. I've played with different models here. We have spin boxes to set kind of some some ranges, and you'll see when this is all when this is all running what it looks like. Okay, so I evaluated that cell. Let's add our widget. Our widget doesn't really do much. In fact, we're kind of pretending. Yeah, we're, we're pretending it's going to be useful, um, but we're not really do, doing much with it. But look, we added it. Um, as I said, you know, we have things for selecting the model, changing the sigma. This is kind of like the range of, that the Gaussians will be applied for the intensities. We can select edges, texture, et cetera. You can play around with all this. Um, the live model fitting live prediction is actually very useful to do here. Okay, so we have our widget. We put our painting layers in, nothing's connected yet. What do we really want to do? Okay, so for those of you who haven't used Elastic, the, the, what our end goal here is we want to just, you know, paint some region and have a prediction generated for the rest. That, and we want to just do that iteratively. When we see something looks wrong, we're going to paint it and correct it. And hopefully our model will just keep getting better and better over time. Okay, so what are we going to do? Oh, there's some stuff that's a little complicated. You don't really have to worry about this currying thing, um, but it does. It just is a way that we can actually, when we create the function the first time, we can have it linked to a viewer and linked to a particular widget, which is that that UI we added on the side. We're going to do some things like refresh our painting layer while we paint. Um, something I don't know what went up with those comments. Um, then we have some threads. Uh, threads, why do we have them? So as you saw when I calculated the features, it did take a second. Um, we don't want Napari to freeze when we're calculating features because we want to keep painting. So we're going to do this on a separate thread, which is basically another process running on your computer separate from the one that's controlling the actual UI interactions on Napari. So, Whenever data changes, we're going to create this thread and run it, calculate segmentations, and do whatever this threaded on data change function does. Okay, let's figure out what it does. We're going to also refresh the prediction layer. Easy. Okay, so we're storing the model outside of the function. That's so you can play around with it later, later because there are some, some ways you can make this significantly more advanced. Threaded on data change. What does it do? So we have things like corner pixels. You don't have to get too worry about that too much, but it basically is specifying this top, I mean, the top corner, the corners of your image. So we know like what area we want to work with um, as, because we only maybe want to calculate on the current area in view. This dims current step is where we are on our slider in, in this exact case. Um, 
we're going to compute a mask. It's going to be different under two different circumstances, um, but let's just actually ignore this one for now. Um, our mask is saying we want all data for this point in the slider and everything in our corner pixels. So everything in view. Um, okay. And then we're going to fetch the data. So our layer, our layer here, the crop 3D is, was named data layer. So we're grabbing the part of the image that corresponds to those masked indices. Okay. And we want to have labels from our painting data that we're also going to grab from masked indices. Okay. So we want to extract training labels. So we want to compute features for this region we've extracted from the image and use our feature parameters. These feature parameters are being uh, passed here, but they're actually being fetched, uh, harvested from the UI we created over here. So we can control these and basically change this on the fly. Okay, so that's how we compute features and our labels are being extracted from this like masked painted region. So for all pixels that are relevant, for all painted pixels that are relevant, we're going to do our training. Cool. Um, we have some stuff. This is not ideal, uh, but for skipping if we haven't started painting yet. And then if we have this live model fitting box checked, we're going to update our model. Other And okay, so we may be using an old model. We may be using an updated model. Um, then if we've checked live prediction, what we want to do is we want to take whatever the active region is in this case, our corn, like defined by our corner pixels, compute features and make a prediction. And then we want to update that prediction into the prediction layer here. Okay, cool. Not so bad. Uh, so update model and please interrupt anytime. Uh, I guess we're low on time, so maybe it's better to send a message and I can follow up afterwards if necessary. Um, okay, so update model. This is actually just using scikit-learn. Uh, this is not super complicated machine learning here, which is kind of nice. I like it. Um, so we use a random force classifier, very basic features. Um, so we want to make you know 50 different decision trees in a random forest. Uh, we have some constraints on this depth of the trees, et cetera. And we're going to fit it and return our model. That's all the update model is doing, and prediction's even easier. Uh, so this function's coming from scikit image, but it still is is actually kind of just using scikit learn under the hood. And we're just saying, take our features that we're passing in and make a prediction of what the classes are that you learned. And finally, we're going to do one last thing. We have to connect everything together. So Kasha showed you in that in that animation demo how you can have events connected to moving moving this plane through the label volume. So here, what we want to connect it to is we want to connect it to when the camera changes. So maybe we've moved our current view. We want to make a new prediction. We've changed our slider. That's another time we want to update our prediction. And certainly when we're painting, we want to either update our model or update our prediction. Okay, so I have not been evaluating this code as I went. So let's see and hope for the best. All right. All right. Um, moment of truth. I have to select my painting layer to annotate. Um, okay, okay. We have some live predictions happening. All right, so I showed you I have all these segmentations I don't like. So it's a little laggy with the current mode. Okay, so I erased all of label number two. So now all we have is this painted region here. In the, let me show you. So this is all that's painted right now. Uh, and so we don't have anything labeled as two. So we can't predict actually that anything has that label. So that's here. We want to paint, oops, sorry, I want to paint the background. A little laggy, yeah. I, I have a version that's less laggy, but it adds a lot more lines of code. Okay, so you see as we move, we're updating our model. Um, 
one thing that's actually a little cool. Um, so there's a little bit of a hack here, of course. So it's only grabbing labels that are in view. Again, this is something I'm very happy to talk to folks about online if they want to keep playing with this. Um, so if I move too far out of view, like here, now we don't see any of the other labels. So everything's predicted like that. Um, now, if we go back in view, this is just kind of the cool things about using a very hackable edit uh, viewer. Let's turn off model fitting. So now let's move to a layer that doesn't have any predictions. And we can just start predicting. Uh, so actually, when I was writing this the first time, I ended up like having some issues, having it process the whole stack. And actually, I did this awful, awful hack of running a, running a loop that would basically just move the slider one and use the fact that it's doing this live prediction to update the image. Um, so why is that interesting? So let's just turn this off for a second. And now, now actually, we've been actually segmenting in 3D. Um, so you can see we've got these volumes coming through. Um, and so we can keep going. You can see you can see clearly where my what I was viewing on the screen, clearly not the whole image, but I was capturing the zebrafish. Um, yeah, and I can basically go on from here. Uh, but so there's a lot of variations I've played with for this, uh, but I probably shouldn't take a lot more time because we need to fit Ashley in. So let me stop sharing. And do folks have any questions or anything? Do, do the federal repositories accept czars? Um, I should, I don't, I, I can't give you a quotable answer on that. I, there's no reason not to, because what you would do is you would just zip them and then upload them. Uh, so it's kind of, it's a similar deal, uh, but that comes with it. You lose a little bit of the benefit of czar, the fact that you, you can access things blockwise. Uh, but there, I mean, so it's uh, one one place that's very important to know about is the IDR repository, the image data repository. So that is hosting a bunch of czars, and that's one place where you can really take advantage of it, and they do support uploads. Okay, I will hand it over to you, Ashley. All right, thanks, Kyle. Um, yeah, we're running a little short on time, and I think everyone... Most people following along are using the um, bundled app. So I don't expect people to follow along with some of this because we're going to sort of branch outside of the bundled app. But uh, I'm just going to give a little bit of information on packaging. Uh, hopefully you can still see my screen now. Um, so the, what I'm going to try to convince you of here is that packaging is important. It's very important for dissemination of your research, or if you want to just make sure other people can replicate your results, or even if you want to be able to replicate your results six months from now, um, it's important to put some effort into packaging. And the amount of effort that can go into that is on a spectrum, and it's going to depend on what you're doing. Um, anyone in here is, who's a Pythonista may be familiar with the Zen of Python. This particular one has been a huge sticking point for Python for a long time uh, in terms of packaging. There should be one and preferably only one obvious way to do it. There's kind of two, um, but I'm gonna just convince you, or I'll try to convince you um, that building around Napari is gonna simplify things a lot. So just follow the happy path that we explain here uh, and it's gonna help you out a lot in terms of reaching a broader audience with your code. So some quick definitions of, First thing you want to do is like think about what you're building. If it's just a script or a notebook for yourself, you may think about packaging differently than if you're building an entire application like Napari itself. And in between there, you might have something like a library or a plugin. And this is kind of what we're going to focus on today um, is taking something that others might want to build on or integrate. So like what Kyle just showed is a great example, turning something like that into a plugin. Um, Basic things, you also are going to want to just write portable code. This is great news for Python users because Python's generally cross-platform, especially when you're sticking to this kind of scientific ecosystem stuff. Um, if you're not doing a ton of stuff in the sys or OS modules within the built-in library, you're generally pretty safe. Um, so you'll need to pick a minimum Python version to support. 
consider your dependencies. So like you want things to be uh, generally portable themselves if you're going to rely on them. You want things that are easy to install and don't require you to do a bunch of compilation steps because that's all going to translate to your own thing as well. Um, a big thing is don't assume stuff about the file system. Like don't expect people to have files in a certain place or, you know, this is a sort of common gotcha that people use a certain type of slash uh, for a, a file separator and that may not work on Mac OS or Windows or something like that. Um, so just be conscious of that. And then also GUIs can be tricky. The nice thing here is that Napari is going to handle a lot of that for you. And the key is when you're writing a um, plugin, don't depend on PyQt or PySide directly. You want to depend on QtPy, which is sort of an abstraction over those things. Uh, you could also consider web-based technologies. That doesn't really apply to Napari here uh, at the moment, although the Workshop plugin is a great example of launching um, Jupyter Notebooks out of Napari. So you can still do some of that stuff too. So then I mentioned there's kind of two ecosystems here. We have PIP and Conda. And if you're using Conda, you're also going to be using PIP. Um, PIP is kind of the standard. It's a package manager that can install and, and manage your packages. Um, it's sort of like the standard for the Python ecosystem, so it expands much beyond the scientific computing ecosystem. Conda solves more problems. It's focused more on scientific computing, so it means it's also not just Python packages. So there's some overlap here, but not entirely. Um, and they both exist for sort of historical reasons, but I think they both still have uh, certain advantages. So you're going to need to keep track of your dependencies. This is a graph of the dependencies for Napari. And the takeaway here is just that it gets pretty complicated. And so you want to manage these in a way that is reasonable for what you're trying to accomplish. So creating a list of your dependencies, whether you're using PIP or Conda, can be pretty straightforward. And these let you like recreate a virtual environment. So the, the key for this slide is basically definitely use virtual environments once you start doing things sort of outside of the Napari bundled app. The Napari bundled app provides its own virtual environment, but if you're branching out from there, you want to consider like, you know, trying to keep environments with only the packages you might need. Otherwise, this graph just explodes even bigger. Um, sometimes this is too strict or not strict enough. So uh, for libraries, you want to kind of loosely couple with dependencies so that you don't conflict if someone wants to install something else. Uh, but if you want to get more strict, you can use things like pip tools or conda lock to really lock down a, a dependency tree for like reproducibility. For example, if you want to provide something that goes along with a paper you've written, uh, you sort of want to freeze that as a snapshot in time and being very strict with how you uh, specify dependencies and their exact versions can be a good way to do that. Docker is another way to do that. Um, and you see kind of a lot of people moving to Docker for these type of things. Uh, it's generally not practical for libraries because it makes it hard to integrate with other stuff. Um, you'd have to sort of build a whole service that's running in a container. Uh, it's also not great for GUIs. There's still a big learning curve, especially um, depending on what trying to community you're trying to reach. It may, if you're very familiar with Docker, it sounds like, yeah, you just run the container. But a lot of people then have to learn everything about containers just to get to that point. Um, there's still a performance penalty, especially on Mac OS and Windows. Uh, accessing the GPU can be difficult. Images can get pretty big. So it's worth considering, I think. But, you know, again, think about your application. So we're not going to get too deep into that. What is a package? It's basically just your code plus a little bit of metadata. And usually what ends up is an archive. So Python uh, in within the pip ecosystem, they're called wheels. Uh, and a wheel is just a zip file. So you can unzip it. Um, and the only essential metadata you really need is like a package name and version. And then you'll want a list of dependencies, most likely assuming that you're using some amount of dependencies. Uh, so for pip, that pretty much all these days can go in this pyproject.toml file. You might see other packages with these setup config, setup pi, manifest.in, stuff like that. Um, but those things are all kind of getting consolidated into that pyproject.toml. With conda, uh, it's a little bit different. You have this recipe uh, folder with a meta.yaml and then specific build scripts for different platforms. And the way that you upload those is by creating a pull request to uh, this staged recipes, and then it generates a feedstock repository for you. It, it's a bit complicated. There's a little bit of a learning curve, but also um, some of the people that 
uh, the Napari community has been working with has tried to streamline some of this, especially for Napari plugins. So I would focus on the PIP side um, to get started, unless you have very specific dependencies that are going to require you to go into the Condus ecosystem. I'd focus on PIP. It's a much simpler process. And then there are sort of uh, uh, guide paths to get you into the condo ecosystem as well so that you can reach more people. Uh, and so we're going to go through this today, hopefully, <laughs> if we have time of uploading just the to chime in one thing. Yeah. Yeah. So ju just just to tell folks, I I just do it through PIP, and then mm. I, there there are some bots that handle the Conda stuff for us in the Napari ecosystem. So it's actually pretty easy, as Ashley says. Yeah. Focus on PIP. Yeah. So the tooling exists for copying these to Conda Forge. Some of that gets automated, and you may just pay attention to some GitHub notifications. And then if you have questions, come to Zulip or even just comment on those uh, pull requests, and and you'll usually get some help. Um, but another key thing here is. Consider starting from a cookie cutter template. This is true for anything, but especially Napari plugins, this cookie cutter template is great. Uh, and what cookie cutter is, is it gives you like sort of a skeleton of a project and then you can go in and fill it out with, with your own code. Um, let's see. All right. If you get more complicated and you have a, like this, this gets a little bit hairier once you're doing things with compiled extension modules, then you need to be distributing binaries instead of just sort of the source code as you do. Um, this is another application of Docker, but we're using it to just build, not distribute. Um, I think we can skip over that for today because Napari and the Python ecosystem in general has a lot of powers. So you're probably not going to find yourself writing C extensions uh, very early. So I want to convince you that's all pretty complicated or it feels pretty complicated, but Napari plugins are such a good way to do this. And they're just Python packages. They're nothing magic other than that. I think there's one extra metadata file called uh, that can help you get onto the Napari hub or you know, sort of change how things appear on the Napari hub. But in general, uh, that's not even really necessary. Um, so if you learn about Napari plugins, you're going to be learning about Python packages. Uh, I think that will serve you well. They just get installed into a virtual environment wherever your Napari installation is, whether that's the bundled app or if you're doing something more advanced with multiple virtual environments. And then Napari will find them within there and launch them. And it's all very safe. Um, it builds based on this uh, manifest that's the Napari NPE2 is a Napari plugin engine version two. Uh, and it parses metadata. You can contribute file type reader and writers widgets, which are GUI elements that you can click on. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into it, but Magic GUI makes this usually really easy. You can sometimes just take a function and uh, annotate it with what type of parameters it's going to take, and it will generate a GUI for you that's going to show up. Uh, again, rely on QTPy, not uh, the specific Qt backends. You can also provide sample data or even change the theme of Napari through plugins. Uh, and there's a great page on the webs or on the Napari docs. There's actually a few about writing your first plugin, and there's a whole thing about best practices, uh, which is definitely a good idea to check out. And then Napari, like part of the reason that this becomes easy through Napari is that the Napari community in particular has put in a ton of effort into making this bundled app. This is not super easy with Python code, so. Um, we, a lot of these tools, Conda, Menuis, and Constructor have all been changed upstream based on a lot of the efforts from the Napari community to make this bundled app easy to install and everything. And so you can also leverage that if you find yourself building your own application in Python down the line. All right, I'm going to exit this slideshow and go over to, this is part of the workshop then. Uh, it's not a notebook that you need to follow along with, um, but we're going to try to do this live in the command line if I have some time, but we'll see. Um, so basically to do to build a plugin, you need to choose what type of plugin you're going to make. So choose what kind of contribution. I went over the types before. Use the cookie cutter. This is as simple as running this command. So if you follow the earlier parts of the workshop, you'll have this cookie cutter application in your Napari tutorial environment. If you run this, it's going to prompt you with some questions. And maybe we should just switch over to my terminal to show what that'll look like. Um, so I'm going to copy that cookie cutter command and maybe ill-advised do a live demo of this. That's going to look at the repository. You give it your name, uh, email address, uh, GitHub username. So it sort of walks you through all this. I'm going to call this Napari halfway to I2K. 
um, provide this later because we're not going to upload to GitHub. Uh, give it a name, short description, sure. Uh, and then all those contributions, it's going to ask you about each one. I think the only one we're going to do here is the doc widget. So let's see me say no, no, no. Uh, is that the one widget plugin? Yeah. Uh, no, don't need pre-commit. You can look into all these um, in the Napari Cookie Cutter repo. It lets you choose a license. And now if you look in this folder, this directory, Napari H2I2K is the one I just generated. I'm sorry if my text is super small, maybe I can make that better. Uh, and you can see it gives you the full structure here. So it created that pyproject.toml. It has the setup.cfg, which I said that you don't need and same with manifest.in, but those are hopefully going away at some point soon. Uh, if we look in the source directory, you'll see that the main part here is this widget.py. This gives you an example widget. And here, this is showing how to use magic GUI. So this will give you a widget to tell you which layer you have selected. Um, so you can dive into there or copy pieces from Kyle's previous tutorial into here is a great exercise. Um, looking through that, um, um, uh, making a sample plugin sort of guides you through all this and how to how to do a little bit more there. But the part I'm going to jump to is how to actually upload this. Um, and so from here, we just need to install a couple other things, which are probably already installed here, honestly. But uh, build is the Python um, sort of package that actually turns your code into a Python package, uh, and then you can just run that with Python dash m build. It's going to build that in an isolated environment. And it does two things here. So if I look into the dist, it's going to show this. This is just a zipped version of all my code. And then this one I mentioned is also, well, this is also basically a zip file, but it ends in .whl for wheel, which is what Python calls its packages. This is ready to upload. Uh, and we're going to use an application called Twine to upload that. So that's installing Twine. And I'm going to upload here to TestPyPI. So TestPyPI is a complete repository that mirrors how PyPI, the Python package index, behaves. Um, and if I click this, I'm going to have to share back to that screen. But you can see now my package is live. This is an Apari plugin. Uh, it, the key here is that if you go down to the frameworks, you should see Napari in the frameworks. With that, the Napari plugin ecosystem, a bunch of stuff happens behind the scenes for that to show up in your plugin browser, for Napari to realize that this is a plugin if you install it in the same uh, um, environment. Uh, if you have a GitHub repo and everything, it's going to show up on the Napari hub as well in about five to 10 minutes. Uh, and you'll start getting pull requests to turn that into a Conda package, um, you know, sometime within the next few hours or days or something like that. I think the, the first one is a little bit slow because there's some, maybe a, even a manual step involved there um, by some volunteers. But then uh, after that, anytime you upload a new package, you'll see it there. So uh, hopefully, <laughs> let's see, that brings us to the end. We have two minutes left, so not a ton of, uh, time left for questions, but I am happy to answer questions about this kind of stuff on Zulip as well. Um, and yeah, hopefully this convinces you that making a plugin we've shown you through Napari is very easy and actually distributing it is also easy. Thanks to all the efforts of the Napari community. And I'll pass it back to Kyle to wrap us up. Ashley, would you present that final slide in the deck? I just added it. Yes. Here. Oh, yeah. Great. Um, yeah, uh, very quick feedback form. We would love to hear feedback about how this went. Um, and thanks, everybody, for all your attention. Awesome.
thanks everyone. Yeah, it's Daniel is all these links. Follow up with Sanzulip. Image SC is a great place to also post your Napari questions. That's a like if they're deeper questions, detailed questions that you need fast feedback on are often good for Zulip. Image SC, uh, the forum is a great place for things that you think might other people might be experiencing. Uh, yeah, and so reach out. Thank you for attending. Thanks, y'all. Have a great rest of your Thursday. Thank you.